This video is sponsored by Manscaped.com, but more on that in a moment. Ireland is one of the richest countries in the world, but you already know that. Practically all the big tech companies from Apple to Google have their European headquarters in Ireland. If you work in anything related to IT, you've probably received an offer to work in Dublin. What you probably don't know is that the country is really rich, richer even than Switzerland. But not only that, Ireland has been growing at a rate of an emerging country over the last decade. Remember 2020, the year of the coronavirus? That year when practically every country in the world went into recession. Well, Ireland not only continued to grow, its GDP grew by 5.8%. To give you an idea, these are the figures typical of a country like China or Vietnam. All of this is surprising, especially if we take into account that many economists have been predicting a hypothetical economic collapse in Ireland for years. Among them is Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman. However, right now, the average salary in Ireland is at $44,200 a year. And in 2015, Ireland broke every record imaginable when they grew by 25%. That's right, 25% GDP growth. Okay, this number has a small catch, but we'll talk about that later. The question is, why? What makes Ireland so incredibly prosperous? Many of you probably already have an answer in your head. Low taxes. Exactly. Ireland has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the world. This has served to attract the world's largest multinationals. However, there is some news. Check this out. Republic of Ireland to increase corporation tax rates to 15%. And now the question is, now that they are going to raise the corporate tax level, won't that be the end of the goose that lays the golden egg? Or maybe Ireland is much more than a low tax country. Why exactly is Ireland so rich? Why do they keep growing as if they were an emerging country? Today, we're going to answer all of these questions. But first, this is one of those videos where we're going to start off with a little bit of history. Let's get cracking. Shipping up to Boston. I know what many of you are thinking, especially if you're watching this video from the United States. The first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Ireland is the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Boston. A parade that has become famous for the traditional Dropkick Murphys concert. And yes, you did hear correctly, I said Boston, Massachusetts, and not Dublin. The truth is that there are more Irish descendants living in the United States than in Ireland itself. Here's a chart. Here you can see how Ireland has been losing population since the 19th century. That is, since even before it became independent <clears throat> from the British. And there is one explanation for this. Poverty. For centuries, the island of Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, but they were dirt poor. The Irish were second class citizens. And don't think we're talking about first world poverty here either. We're talking about real misery. To give you an idea, in the 1940s alone, more than one million Irish died of starvation. However, in 1937 and after a bloody civil war, the Republic of Ireland drafted its constitution. However, poverty and hunger persisted. Why? The answer to that lies in politics. After independence, Ireland opted for an economic model based on self-sufficiency. Think about it. The United States was still recovering from the crash of 29, so Ireland wanted to achieve economic independence. They didn't want to import anything from abroad. You can imagine how that turned out. Protectionism rarely works. But if there was one country where it was even more difficult to make it work, that was Ireland. We're talking about an island with fewer than 4 million inhabitants that was barely industrialised. As you can imagine, it is difficult for such a small economy to become self-sufficient. So in the absence of imports, Ireland continued to lead exports in one thing, the Irish themselves. That explains why some US cities like Boston have such a strong connection to Ireland. However, those things began to change in the year 1959 with this gentleman you see on the screen, Sean Thomas O'Kelly. And I'm not making that up, that's actually his Irish name. This gentleman was the Prime Minister of Ireland and was the catalyst of the first attempt to liberalise the Irish economy. And why do I say attempt to? Well, because good old O'Kelly only followed some parts of the recipe. In 1959, he created a free trade zone next to Shannon Airport. This is how the first foreign companies arrived. During the following decades, Ireland reduced corporate taxes to attract even more companies. For example, Apple was established in Ireland in 19. However, none of this made life better for the Irish. Quite the opposite, in fact. For one thing, foreign companies simply set up their tax headquarters and then that was it. In other words, the first offices of Apple or Hewitt Packard had only a few accountants on staff. But that wasn't all. In those years, Ireland had hardly any industry. Its companies were stuck in the 19th century. So by permitting imports, foreign products were shattering the market. What's the conclusion to that then? In 1987, Ireland had 17% unemployment. Wages were a third of their UK equivalent. And Ireland was once again leading an export in Irish people. To put it another 
another way. No matter how much Ireland lowers its corporate tax, Ireland was still a poor country. So how did Ireland become the Celtic tiger that we know today? Well, we're going to take a look at that right now. But before we continue, there comes a time in a man's life when he has to shave down there. And believe me, when that moment comes, I do not recommend using a regular razor. A friend of mine tried that and now we call him Uno. That's all I can say on the matter. In other words, there's only one realistic option for trimming below the waist, and that's Manscaped. This performance package by Manscaped is an all-in-order starter kit for body hair grooming and hygiene. Included in the package is the marvelous Lawnmower 4.0 electric trimmer. With its unique skin-safe technology, it helps prevent nicks and cuts. And don't worry, I'm not going to give you a demonstration in front of the camera. Since this trimmer is both cordless and waterproof, you can use it in the shower or run it under the sink to prevent any messy cleanup. Also, the razor has a little built-in LED light that helps us to see better in all the nooks and crannies, and even has a travel lock for when you go traveling. But that's not all. In addition to the razor, the Manscaped Performance Package includes an epilator for nose hairs, the so-called Weed Whacker. And there's two deodorants designed for the male crotch, the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver. Now that summer is coming, they'll come in especially handy. And as always, we have a very special discount for all of you who follow us here on Visual Politic. Basically, if you use the code VPEN, you will get a 20% discount plus free international shipping. So, wherever you are, you you can get Manscaped, plus a free pair of boxer briefs and a free toiletry bag. Remember folks, Manscaped, the perfect tools for your family jewels. And now, let's get back to our video. The Roar of the Celtic Tiger The question, the big question here for Ireland in the 1980s was, what would it take for multinationals to hire Irish people? Okay, okay, we are rolling out the red carpet for you to set up your offices in our country, but we want real offices, not just a tax headquarters. And that was the question that Mr. Charles Handy, who was the Prime Minister of Ireland in 1987, wondered. This good gentleman and his team realised one thing. Yes, it is true, Ireland had low taxes for companies, but everything else was a real mess. Workers had to pay up to 60% income tax, and the labour legislation was so strict that hiring and firing became a real bureaucracy bureaucratic nightmare. Hagney undertook the real liberalisation that Ireland needed, and the results were not long in coming. Hewlett Packard's Lexlip plant is to employ 2,000 people by 2,000. Suddenly, the Irish media started publishing news stories like this almost every month. To give you an idea, in just over a decade, the Irish went from being paid two-thirds of what they were paid by the English neighbours to surpassing them. Those were the years of the Celtic Tiger. The country was on fire. But wait a minute, because we're not just talking about multinationals. During those years, a lot of Irish giants emerged. Are you familiar with Primark? Are you familiar with Ryanair? Well, these are both companies that were born or started to expand during those years. To give you an idea, this was such a prosperous time that it even became fashionable to celebrate weddings and christenings from a helicopter. Banks were giving mortgages left, right and centre, and the Irish soon got used to living well. Very well. In other words, Ireland was something of a libertarian's wet dream. Proof that the free market worked almost miraculously. However, that joy only lasted a few years. Check this out. The domino Effect We could say that Ireland is the bridge between the United States and Europe. This means that Irish banks were too exposed to US banks. This explains why the great financial crisis of 2008 hit Ireland particularly hard. Here's another graph for you. Here you can see how Ireland suffered a recession, even worse than the United States. And you can imagine how many economists and analysts were chanting, we told you so, in those years. But that's not all. What do you think Ireland did to avoid the collapse of its banks? Exactly. It asked for a bailout. Ireland was the first European country to bail out its banks. The European Union and the International Monetary Fund bailed out Ireland with a total loan of 67.5 billion euros. To give you an idea, that is 40% of the country's entire GDP. And how did Ireland hope to pay back all this money? Exactly with austerity measures. In other words, Ireland raised some indirect taxes and cut public spending on all fronts. They cut civil servants' salaries by 14%, closed up to 41 government agencies, and, as you can imagine, this sparked the biggest protests in modern Ireland to date. And that's when economists such as Paul Krugman once again chimed in with the I told you so chorus. Check this out. 
Ireland is now in its third year of austerity, and confidence just keeps draining away. And you have to wonder what it will take for serious people to realise that punishing the populace for the banker's sins is worse than a crime. It's a mistake. Paul Krugman in the New York Times. Kind of rings true, right? But keep that quote in your mind. It's from an article written in 2010, and two years later, Time decided to contradict Paul Krugman. Take a look at this. <laughs> As you can see, Ireland has not only recovered from the crisis, right now it is substantially richer in terms of GDP per capita than the United States itself. And yes, look closely at the jump between 2014 and 2016. That's the date when Ireland broke all records and increased its GDP by as much as 25%. The question is, how did they do that? Was there any cheating? Well, we're going to look at that now. When GDP is not enough. Imagine Paul Krugman's face. He predicted Ireland's economic collapse, an austericide that never came. Within a few years, Ireland put aside the debt crisis and returned to growth as if there was no tomorrow. And not just growth, it broke all the records in economic history, a growth rate of 25%. Boom! So sorry, not sorry, China. What do you think good old Krugman did? Well, he started to investigate the real reason for such spectacular growth, and he found this. Leprechaun economics. Ireland reports 26% growth, but it doesn't make sense. Why are these in GDP? Paul Krugman. That's that's right. The truth is that, in this case, Krugman was right. That rise of more than 25% of GDP is due to the fact that large multinationals, mainly Apple, moved their profits to Ireland to benefit from such low taxes. To give you an idea, Apple alone came to move more than 147 billion euros, that's 149 billion dollars, to Ireland between 2004 and 2014. That's a simple financial transaction, right? But 147 billion euros is a real money grab, especially for a small country like Ireland, with a GDP that is now, in 2020, at 418 billion euros. Put it another way, the statistics do not reflect reality. All that Apple money hasn't made it into the Irish economy. In reality, it's just a number on a balance sheet. And the truth is that Apple are not the only ones. According to the IMF, 60% of foreign investment in Ireland is just numbers. Krugman called this, imaginatively, leprechaun economics. Leprechauns are elf-like creatures from Irish mythology. Put it another way, classical econometrics simply doesn't work in Ireland. The statistical distortions created by the impact on the Irish national accounts of the global asset and activities of a handful of large multinational corporations have now become so large as to make a mockery of conventional uses of Irish GDP. Patrick Honahan, ex-governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. In fact, Ireland currently uses different metrics than other countries to measure its economy. But statistical distortions aside, the leprechaun economics phenomenon served to bring all of Ireland's tax schemes into the debate. Scores of multinationals have been taking advantage of Ireland's low taxes to create tax schemes in which they pay very little tax. In fact, for 2017, both the European Union and the United States have come out with several measures to avoid tax competition from Ireland. And that's not all. Ireland's own government has already committed to raising taxes. Check this out. Republic of Ireland to increase corporation tax rate to 15%. And the question is, to what extent is Paul Krugman right? That is, if Ireland's wealth is due to accounting tricks and low taxation, are we facing the end of the Irish miracle? Well, we'll look at that here. Made in Ireland Let's be clear, Ireland's success is not about attracting big business with low taxes. If prosperity were as simple as lowering taxes, Andorra would be a land of millionaires and Liberia would not be so poor. Ireland's real success is in getting those companies to actually establish themselves in the country and hire people. In addition, Ireland has succeeded in creating its own companies that are already giants in the country. For instance, are you familiar with Ryanair? It is the giant of low-cost flights here in Europe. If you live in Europe, you will have surely flown with this company at some point. It is one of the most disruptive companies in history. But the truth is that Ryanair is just the tip of an iceberg. Oh, much, much bigger industry. It may surprise you, but Ireland is the world's airline powerhouse. That's right, keep these names in mind. Aircap, GE Capital Aviation Services, and Avalon. You've probably never heard of these companies, but they are the titans of aircraft leasing. Most of the world's commercial airlines do not own their aircraft, they lease them. And that is how 22% of the commercial aircraft flying around the world come from Irish companies. And what about software? That's right, this is a sector where all these large multinationals are located. From Google to Facebook, all of them have their tax headquarters in Ireland. But we're not just talking about tax headquarters anymore. The software sector alone employs 24,000 people. Not bad, considering that Ireland's population is lower than 5 million people. In other words, Ireland's economy is not only hyper-diversified, it is also full of world leaders, and all of this explains 
explains why not even the coronavirus has made a dent in the country. Put it another way, Ireland does not appear to be on the verge of any major crisis. At least, not the kind of crisis that Paul Krugman was imagining. Does this mean the Irish are not in trouble? Not exactly. But we're talking about a different kind of crisis. Check this out. Housing crisis will decide Ireland's political future. Exactly. This is the B side of economic success. Ireland is no longer exporting labour. Quite the contrary. Cities like Dublin and Cork are receiving people from everywhere and there is hardly any housing to accommodate so many people. This is not a minor problem and it is something that affects many other countries but Ireland has a particularly pressing problem in this regard. The question now is, how can it be solved? More importantly, what lessons can be drawn from the Irish model for other countries? How do you think the crisis caused by the Ukrainian war will affect Ireland? You can leave me your answers in the comments below. And don't forget, here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to our channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know, and I'll see you next time.